Wonderful. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. It is uh, a delight always to have uh, Dr. Angela Cartelessa here. And today uh, sh her guest is Marquise Fels. Angela, take it away. Yeah, thanks Srikant. Hi everybody. So nice to see some familiar faces and also some, some new faces and some new names here today. Um, for those of you who don't know who the heck I am, just a quick introduction. In 2018, I earned my doctorate in human and organizational learning from George Washington University. And of course, as part of the doctoral program, I had to write a, a dissertation and do research. So I chose to research modern day polymaths, which is kind of a fancy word for a Renaissance man or woman. So that's who I am. And that's um, why I'm here talking about polymathy and intrapersonal diversity. But first, before we dive in further, I just want to give a definition of what polymathy is. I do this every time we have one of these meetups, just in case anybody's not familiar. But I like to use Robert and Michelle Root Bernstein's definition, um, which is that polymathy is active engagement in multiple interests or endeavors, integrating vocations with avocations simultaneously or serially across the lifespan. And I also wanna say that you do not have to be a Leonardo da Vinci to consider yourself a polymathic person. It exists on a spectrum and on a range. So I wanna share a little bit about this term intrapersonal diversity, just to start off. So back when I, I was toying with what do I wanna research? What do I wanna write my dissertation on? I, I was like, I wanna write about Renaissance men and women. And I kept trying to find a better word for that because Renaissance man isn't even one word, it's two words. And, and I looked up synonyms, I, I found the word polymath and I, I was like, I've never heard of that. I'm not gonna use it, I don't like it, ooh. So I rejected polymath for quite some time. And then I just started thinking in my own brain, well, well what, am I, what am I talking about? And I realized that when we think about diversity, we, we almost always think about diversity out there in groups. And we don't think about it at the micro level of analysis. We think about uh, we think about it at the meso, at the macro levels. But I thought, could you think about this phenomenon at the individual level? Because at the end of the day, that's what I wanted to study. I wanted to study intrapersonal diversity, diversity within one's own personhood. And I thought I made it up. I honestly, for a while, there was like, oh my goodness, I came up with this great uh, phrase, this great way of thinking about what I want to study. And then I realized, um, actually, no, I didn't. Other people had thought of it before me. So that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm really excited to welcome Marquise Fells. I met Marquise probably, I don't know, it's probably almost a year ago because he joined our Facebook group, Polymaths Place. And he, um, he was really passionate about this subject and very dedicated and very kind of studious and serious about how he could promote polymathic ideals. And he used, he, he frequently, I heard him using the phrase intrapersonal diversity, like he read my dissertation and that, that stuck with him and he used it. So part of why I wanted to invite Marquise here today is he's, he's one of the few people who uses this phrase intrapersonal diversity, like I do, as a way of conceptualizing what polymathy is. So before I go any further, though, I just want to um, hand it over to Marquise for a minute or two or three, however long you feel comfortable, Marquise. Just tell us about who you are and your background and why you care about this topic. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for introducing me. Um, as Angela mentioned, my name is Marquise. I am a location independent entrepreneur with nowhere near as many accomplishments as Dr. Kalesa, <laughs> but I'm working on it. Um, my journey into this world really started in 2018 when I withdrew from a materials and metallurgical engineering degree at the Colorado School of Mines, so a prestigious engineering degree. But I decided to withdraw in my junior year, so my third year. And this was really the culmination of just feeling suffocated. Um, I've always been a passionate learner. Schooling has, in academics, they've, they've always come easy to me just because I love to learn. But I really realized in my third year that university was suffocating my desire to learn. And um, it took me three years to realize that because I just kept waiting. Um, my advisors and stuff, they're like, oh, you just haven't found the right degree. Just wait until you get into your like major specific classes and then everything will get better. And so I just continuously did that until like I just realized it wasn't getting better. 
So I withdrew in 2018. And within a year, I had consumed, like I found Dr. Cadales's dissertation and read all of that. I was introduced to Emily Wapnick's work and learned about the multi-potentialite perspective of polymathy. Um, I just really fell in love with this idea that specialization is not the only way to be successful. Um, because up until then, that's what I believed, that's what I was taught, that in order to be successful, in order to have an impact on the world, in order to really bene benefit humanity, you really do have to narrow in and specialize in something, one aspect of the human experience. Um, and so after reading Angela's, Dr. Cadales's dissertation, the I became fascinated with this idea of interpersonal diversity, this idea that you're not only the culmination of the one thing that you're passionate about, but you can really expand your mind and your perspective by embracing many skills, many interests, many experiences. And so for me, because I am so passionate about learning and like just exploring as much as possible, this idea of interpersonal diversity and the fact that I could someday become a polymath really motivated me to, um, just, you know, create the structure that oftentimes school, university, and work gives people. Um, so when I took myself out of that, I needed something that would help me create that for myself. And this idea of polymathy is what did it for me. Right. And I just want to give a shout out to you before we dive in further that, you know, you're this young person who's so smart and, and so capable, and you were brave enough to to get out of the path you were on that didn't feel right to you and, and pursue something else. So I just wanna give you a shout out for, for being brave. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so before we um, go any further, I just wanna share a little bit with you guys about this concept of intrapersonal diversity and what I found out about it in the academic literature, just as a, a precursor before we, we dive in more. So when I went to the academic literature and I typed in intrapersonal diversity, I thought, oh, I'm not going to find anything because I made this up, right? No, it, it was there. It did exist. And actually, what I found out about intrapersonal diversity is that it first appeared in the scholarly literature in kind of the science realm. It had to do with physiology. There was a, quite a bit of literature, actually, on the gut microbiome and how having intrapersonal diversity, and that's the phrase they used, in the gut microbiome made someone's body healthier. It made their gut healthier. And there are myriad implications for gut health and what that does for the overall system. But I just wanna point out that intrapersonal, intrapersonal diversity started out kind of in the science literature looking at the gut microbiome. Then, and that was around the year 2000, I wanna say where I started seeing like a, a lot of literature pop up on that. And then, there was some other literature about 2011 or so from Huckman and Stats that showed up. And they started talking about intra, and it's not inter, interpersonal diversity would be in a group like between people. Intra personal diversity means within oneself. So it's not only in the gut microbiome though. Huckman and Stats started writing about intra intrapersonal diversity. And basically they, they said that it has to do with the extent, I'm going to read this. Um, actually, this is a, a different author, but but just to provide a, a, a definition, it's the extent to which members' prior experiences are individually heterogeneous or homogenous. Um, so it's a similar construct to polymathy, and. Part of why I kind of like looking at it through this lens is because there's a lot of talk about how diversity, how important it is to be sensitive to diversity in, in, in humanity, right? Um, and absolutely it is, whether it's race, sex, sexual gender identity, sexual orientation, any of those things, the way that we're different and the way that discrimination against those different groups can take place, we should be sensitive to that and it matters. But in my opinion, the construct of diversity needs to be diversified. It's kind of ironic that we think about it so narrowly. <laughs> I see Jennifer from Chicago laughing. Yes, it's true. We do need to diversify how we think about diversity. Um, and so we shouldn't just look at it in groups. We should look at how does it show up in individuals. And like I said, it shows up in, in scholarly, scholarly literature about the gut microbiome. And it also shows up to some extent um, in the scholarly, scholarly literature around like management and in organizations. Um, 
So, so if we want to really understand and leverage diversity, we need to think about it at the individual level. And, and so I, I want to underscore that. And that's my opinion, of course. There may be people who disagree and think that we shouldn't talk about diversity at the individual level. I don't know. But for me, I think, I think we do need to understand diversity in all its diversity. Okay. Another way that the scholarly literature talks about intrapersonal diversity focuses on, they call it functional intrapersonal diversity. And what that means, it has to do with their professional experiences and professional experiences only. Um, specifically, how much are, is a person either a narrow specialist with limited experience in a range of functions versus a broader generalist whose prior work experience spans a number of functional areas. So, and that's Bunderson and Sutcliffe. Um, and so the reason they say functional intrapersonal diversity is because it has to do again with the functions that they know how to do in a professional setting. Um, one of the things that bothered me about what I didn't find in the literature though, is that it was really this idea of intrapersonal diversity was limited to the gut microbiome or work functions. And that was it. That There was no other talk of any intrapersonal diversity in, in, in all of humanity, in all of the academic literature, except in those two areas. And so I thought that's not right. Like we should think about intrapersonal diversity. They're onto something. They're getting at it with the gut microbiome. They're getting at it with the professional uh, experiences functionally. But what about other types of intrapersonal diversity that could exist? Let's pay attention to that. So there's my diatribe. I just wanted to like put that out there that yes, this is a thing. I didn't make it up. It exists in the academic literature and it's a thing and we should pay attention to it. It's also a different slant on how to think about polymathy. Um, you know, that, that it's a type of, of diversity that you can foster and grow in yourself. Okay. Now I'm done yapping. I want to ask Marquis some questions because I know he has, he has looked at this phenomenon and he's thought about it. So Marquis, back when you, you first joined Polymass Place, by the way, if you're not a member of Polymass Place on Facebook, join us. There's also a YouTube channel, uh, with a bunch of videos, um, uh, called Polymass Place also. But you, you kind of latched on to this idea of interpersonal diversity. You even used it. You, you said it. You wrote it. You know, I mean, you like you used it in a post or two, even in the group. And I thought, wow, it seems to have resonated with you enough to where you actually, it's in your lexicon now. And can you tell me why? Like, why did it resonate with you? Why did you start using it and how you think about this concept? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so I think that initially my in, like most people when you hear the term polymath i feel like a lot of people um connotate that with leonardo da vinci and he's a inspirational figure of course but in some cases he's also um like his pedestal his his accomplishments are so high that it made me personally feel like wow i could never become a polymath and so it wasn't until i realized that one polymathy is really a, a spectrum. So that's how I view it. Um, and once I made that connection, I, for some reason, jumped to, okay, well, how can I increase my position on that spectrum? Maybe I'm over here, like I'm, I want to be a polymath, but I really want to be over here where other people acknowledge me as a polymath. And I'm like, okay, well, how can I get there? And yes, of course, one of those ways would be to go to university and study five different majors, I guess. Like that would be one way to do it, is really just to dedicate myself wholeheartedly to doing it the way that most people would do it. Um, but then when I came across the term intrapersonal diversity in your dissertation, I believe, at least the way that I remember it, the way that you defined it was like um, a range or yeah, like the range of experiences, skills, and or interest, skills, and experiences that an individual has. And to me, that really resonated because even in high school, like one of my biggest aspirations in life is I want to be able to learn so many things, whether it be archery, surfing, like um, psychology, entrepreneurship, like just all these different things that your average person would find impossible. But when you look at it from a perspective of, yeah, so there's really three different categories of things that I could dedicate myself to on a daily basis. I could dedicate myself to these interests. So what am I interested in? And I can list those out and really dive deep into those individually. And then skills. Okay, what are my skills that I have? What skills do I want? Um, and like, how can I start dissecting that immediately? 
and then experiences also are so important because like yeah you experiences your daily experiences your childhood experiences that really define the way that you think about the world and so going out of your way to create different experiences is also so important and so to me like when really why I latched onto it was because obviously I want to be a polymath I think that's pretty clear by now and so I was trying to figure out how I could make that happen and so for me by viewing it in this way of interpersonal diversity it just became more real it became tangible something that I could accomplish and not something that wow Leonardo Yeah, and you're not the only one, by the way, who's polymathic, but feels nervous to use that word as part of how they identify. So saying, you know, I'm a person with with intrapersonal diversity is another way of sort of having that identity and just having another term. Mm. And I just want to say too, yes, absolutely, to your point about knowledge and skills and experiences, because so much of the conversation around polymathy is just information and and knowledge and learning and what I can do with that what skills I have but for me personally I think the the breadth of living isn't just limited to what you can stuff in your brain or what you can do with it it's also the experiences that you foster that you uh that you expose yourself to. And, and that experience might be that you go snowboarding or you do rock climbing, Marquis. I mean, yeah. that's part of having the full human experience too. So I like that you you pointed out how experiences matter too, and that that's part of your interpersonal diversity, not just your knowledge and skills. So mm -hmm. great point. I'm curious, um, you know, since you, you like this term intrapersonal diversity, like you like conceptualizing it that way, why do you think people don't, think about it. Like, I mean, I literally, when I posted, um, about this meetup, by the way, and I said, we're going to be talking about intrapersonal diversity as a, a different way of understanding polymathy. Someone was like, is that even a thing? <laughs> like, it's, like people are like, never heard of it, never thought of it. And, and yeah. we, you know, we think about diversity and how important it is all the time, but it's like mind blowing to people to think that diversity could exist within a person mm -hmm. and it can, yeah. why do you think people don't don't realize this and and why is it important to think about intrapersonal diversity yeah um my immediate like what i'm drawn to immediately is that diversity holds such connotation like it's so weighted in people's brains because especially in the times we're living in now and i think just like over the past couple of decades yeah um we've all been taught that external diversity is so important and that it needs a lot of emphasis like you need to be really sensitive to the diversity in a room because one of course that the diver like the more cultures the more people which is really interesting well, we'll get to that later i think but just the more people you have in a room the more ideas obviously and so like it's really i think clear to see that when you have more people there's greater diversity and when you have greater diversity you get greater results and so i think it's really I think like when you're when you're talking about an iceberg, so diversity and at the tip of the iceberg for diversity is just that what's obvious. We can see like all of the different colors of people that are here on the Zoom call right now. Diversity is just obvious. But I think that in modern times, something that a lot of people lack is a self-awareness. And so in order to really view the diversity within an individual, within yourself, you have to be self-aware to acknowledge that, well, maybe I'm not just my like what I specialize in what my job is I'm not just that I also am valuable because of all of these experiences that I like the experiences that I want to pursue like those are a part of what makes me me it's not just the thing that I get paid for I'm valuable beyond that and so that was kind of a long-winded answer but I think that the ultimate like, the core of it is that modern society has placed such an emphasis on external diversity that it's really easy to just forget about what the rest of it is, you know, because we really have been taught in like, again, like you mentioned before, it is important. I am not neglecting the importance of external diversity. But I think that because we have placed such a weight on that, people just don't even look beyond um, the diversity of ex like our physical qualities and traits, if that makes sense. Yeah. And can I just say too, in response to what you said, I'm actually, uh, to be honest, I'm nervous to even talk about intrapersonal diversity in a public setting because I, I, I'm afraid people are going to 
accuse me of diminishing the other mm -hmm. types of diversity. And I'm, I'm not at all intending to do that. Right. I'm just trying to expand conceptions around what human diversity is mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. we, how we think about it. Um, and it absolutely is a sensitive subject and we have a ways to go to improve, you know, race relations and, mm -hmm. and gender equality and like all the right. things that need to happen still. So I'm not meaning um, to diminish from those, but I will say, and I, and again, I feel self-conscious to even say this because someone may accuse me of being insensitive, but one of the things I like about expanding notions of diversity is the current conceptions of diversity are around categories of identity that none of us got to pick. You know, like you didn't get to pick your race, your sex, the genetic inheritance you got. And I didn't get to pick being a white woman born in the United States at the time I was born. Like we, we create these groupings for identity that are fixed mm -hmm. and that create in groups and out groups. And uh, one of the things I like about just expanding what, what diversity could mean, what intrapersonal diversity is, is that it gives us a little bit more choice, you know? Like it, I, I, my intrapersonal diversity isn't just my race and my sex and my sexual orientation now. I can, I can it's about my passions from my heart to some extent. So I, I like, and again, I feel, self-conscious even saying this because people may accuse me of being insensitive to the other types of diversity that exist but I just want to say I really like the idea that you know we can expand our identities beyond fixed categories that none of us had any choice over too you yeah. know yeah, and make it from that. the heart I love that and I think that you really are underscoring something at least what I just thought of was the fact that so in in most circles when you when we think of diversity and the importance of diversity, or at least one example of the importance of diversity that people often give is that, well, in a business setting, if you have more di a more diverse team, then the results and accomplishments are better. And so for some reason, we're associating accomplishment with like a diversity of external qualities. And that's not even what makes people unique. Like that's not why that room is diverse. That room is diverse because of the different experiences and interests and skills that those people have gone through to get them there. And yeah, their skin color or their sexual orientation, like all of those things will have affected their worldview, but it's not the skin color that makes them think differently from you. It's their mm -hmm. different interests, skills, and experiences. And so ultimately, like when we're thinking of diversity, I think it really is important to acknowledge the fact that what we appreciate about diversity is not the external qualities. It really is these identity foundations that you're talking about. Yeah, the, the content of your character, your openness, your curiosity, your bravery, like right. those really enrich a room right. rather than not like- Your skin color. Yeah, exactly. You and know? one of the things I wanna say too that I really love about diversity and appreciating intrapersonal diversity is that you can become this hodgepodge of things that aren't even supposed to go together. And like, it's fun, it's diversity, you know what I mean? Like that makes us more interesting, more alive, more vibrant, more human. And so when we value and explicitly talk about how important intrapersonal diversity is and that it's okay to not fit into a standard box, um, that adds so much more to my life and to, to the room that you're talking about when I'm walking in it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think we've covered so much ground already. <laughs> okay, where, what's my next question here? Okay. I, I, along those lines, I, and again, this is a sensitive subject, so I want to be careful, but there are tensions, right? There are tensions between people from different racial groups, for example, right? Mm -hmm. 2020 really brought this to light, especially in the United States. One of the things I've wondered, I mean, we need to fix, we need to fix race relations. I'm not diminishing that. Mm -hmm. We need more equality. Absolutely. One of the things I've wondered though, is as long as we focus really, really hard on our differences, what does, what does that do to us as a, a human group? Right? Like, 
we need to we need to focus on our differences. We need to be able to be, you know, in in different groups and explore the different parts of our identities, even if we had no say over falling into any of those groups. But what could polymathy or intrapersonal diversity do to maybe heal some of those tensions? And what I mean is, say Marquis, you and I didn't know each other and we, we met at a, a gathering of some kind. I might assume, okay, your skin color is different than mine. You're male, I'm female. And if I, if I see you through those lenses, I will be like, no, we're not gonna have anything in common. Mm -hmm. And I may, I may not even try. Like if I see our difference, I may not even try. But if I, if I, if I see beyond those categories and I say, hey, what do you like to do? What are you passionate about? And you say, I don't know, what do you say? What do you like, Marquise? I like rock climbing. I like traveling. I like learning. <laughs> oh my God, me too. I love traveling. Where have you been? You see what I'm, it, if we focus on other types of diversity, of, of if we have more tools in our toolkit, more experiences, more passions that we can connect around, it opens the door to actually not be so separate and different. It, it creates opportunities for us to find common ground because we have more to pull from. You know what I mean? Because we've got Absolutely. these broad experiences. What do you think about that? Do you see that? Do you agree with that? Or do you think about it differently? No, I absolutely agree. I think that oftentimes, regard, or so I'll, I'll flip it around. We'll say, let's say that you walk into a room and you see Jennifer from Chicago there who <laughs> looks similar to you, you know, um, you guys, so you might go up to her and talk to her, but if her interests, if what she, her experiences, if her skills don't align with you, are you going to like create a connection with her? Are you gonna, is your relationship going to blossom? Probably. No. Right. Because that's like her looking like you ultimately is not what is important. Right. Um, I think that in most cases, the greatest collaboration comes from people who acknowledge that external qualities, that skin color, that um, sexual orientation, that gender, like those things ultimately do not matter because I think that you put it perfectly in the beginning. We did not pick those things. Um, I read a book recently on race relations that was talking about just the, this, like the buffoonery really of the idea of race. It would be like if we just said that all tall people were better than short people. Like that does, does not make any sense. It's and in ultimate... grouping and out grouping. It, humans do this, the in grouping and out grouping. And when you do it over things that people can't change, yes, it, it puts them in a corner. What I'm arguing is how wonderful would our world be? Okay, if we're, if we're humans and our nature is to do in group, out group, let's expand our in group. And polymathy <laughs> is a way to do that. Mm. Polymathy is a way to say, okay, my identity is all these things mm. and I'm not going to squish in a box and you get to be a hodgepodge and a myriad of, of many different facets too. And then we can, we can have a Venn diagram where it's like, oh, we can connect because we both love to travel or we right. both love uh, rock climbing or whatever it may be. It's mm. an, it's an avenue to redirect and pivot some of our tensions potentially if we let it. And Absolutely. I know that's controversial for me to say, and <laughs> someone may accuse me of being insensitive, but I just wonder as someone who has dedicated, gosh, the last almost six years of my life studying polymathy, this is really something I've wondered, like how different would humanity be? How different could we be if we focused on our commonality? And I know we're not there yet, like we have a ways to go, but maybe someday we, we could use intrapersonal diversity and polymathy as a way to find more common ground and not let fixed categories of identity tear us apart. So, okay. One is, okay, switching gears a little bit. I want to talk, um, I mentioned earlier, um, functional intrapersonal diversity. And again, what that means is in the scholarly literature, functional intrapersonal diversity means how many functions have you worked in? 
you've worked in marketing, you've worked in advertising, you've worked in, I don't know, like all the, the, the different functions. And obviously if you've worked in accounting and HR and IT and more than that, then you have more functional intrapersonal diversity. So it has to do with the extent to which someone is a generalist or a specialist in their career, in their profession, but it does not consider the other types of diversity that might exist within a single individual outside of the office, outside of work, like uh, in their hobbies or extracurricular activities, social networks, even emotional diversity, like your ability to allow yourself to experience different emotions. Like that's a kind of human diversity too, isn't it? So, you know, like I said earlier, the idea of human diversity is so fixed and limited. Can we, can we breathe some air into that? Can we expand it? And I'm curious, Marquise, how, if, if we as a, as a species began thinking about human diversity as this larger set of possibilities and not such a fixed few categories, if we thought about human diversity in new and different, more comprehensive ways, what do you think that would do for us? Um, something that I just thought of would be that there would be the formation of different in-groups and out-groups. I think that ultimately it is idealistic to think that if we all just accept the fact that we all have a variety of interests, skills, and experiences that we can all get along, I think that it will just change the in-groups and out-groups ultimately um, on a large, on a large scale, you know? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? What do you think about the idea that by encouraging people to view individuals not from their external, like external diversity, but really their functional diversity or their emotional diversity, you know, just this broad thing that we're talking about. How do you think that that would change the formation of in-groups and out-groups? Hmm. Well, before I answer that question, I just want to say for me, the elephant in the room in all of this is like, this is life. Like what is more important than life, than living life to the fullest? What is more important than living life to the fullest? And I don't, I'm not sure there is anything at the end of the day that is more important than having the full human experience. And that's again, what this concept of intrapersonal diversity is getting at, that there are all these different kinds of ways, not just at work, not just in your gut microbiome, but there are many ways in which you could explore the diversity of your personhood. And in doing so, I think you get a richer life, you get a fuller human experience. Now, how does that affect in groups and out groups? It creates more in groups. I mean, if, if all I know is tree botany, and I walk into that room you mentioned, Marquise, I have a whole lot of out groups and probably very little in group because I, I'm letting my, I'm, I'm forcing myself to be one dimensional in this age of specialization where that's what the dominant ideology tells me to do if I wanna be a good girl and be successful. But if I don't want to be a narrow specialist, and put blinders on. And by the way, we need specialists. I'm not meaning to diminish them either. <laughs> if somebody wants to be a specialist, we need them. Thank you. Thank you for taking one for the team. That's how I feel because I want to do lots of things. But if, if all I know is tree botany, then I've got a whole lot of out groups and very few in groups. But if I'm, um, what's the word I'm looking for? If I like, if I've just got a larger toolkit, more experiences, broader personhood, I can be, here's the thing. I can be a part. I can partially fit in many groups. I may not be able to fit in entirely in any one of them because I'm a hodgepodge of many things. So finding, and we've talked about this in some prior meetups, that this is one of the, the challenges of being a polymath it, is just navigating socially what can feel like a very singular journey uh, because you may never find somebody with the exact mixture of experiences that you've had. I mean, that would, you, we each are singular experiences, you know, like will never to be replicated in all of time. Like, and that's funny we talked about the, the par uh, paradoxes of polymathy a few weeks ago. And I was like, you know, one of the paradoxes is that you're unique, just like everybody else. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day that poly mathy is a way to create more in-groups and that's really a balm that we need, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree. Um, I, I don't know, for some reason in my head, it just, because in my experience, it totally aligns with what you're saying. Um, I have been able to fit in a lot of groups because of my passion for learning. And so like I can easily connect with a lot of people. <clears throat> For some reason, though, in my head, the formation of new in-groups equates to new out-groups as well. So, again, and to me, it just seems idealistic to think that polymathy is a way to fix humans fighting, you know, humans just fight. And maybe that's not true, but in modern times, humans just do not agree. And I'm not sure if the only cause of that is a lack of intrapersonal diversity. Mm, yeah, that's a good that's a good pondering. I want to mention too that I'm not just making up that like polymaths can find more like more in groups and more connections with people. This is what I heard from the people I interviewed. Yeah. Is that their polymathy made it so they could find something to connect with almost anybody they met. Like they can converse, you know, like they mm -hmm. can they can find something to connect with. And it's one of their superpowers actually. Mm -hmm. is that because they have this broad toolkit of, of different experiences and different knowledge and, and uh, different skills that when they meet someone new in particular, it's a, you know, it's just easier to connect. So this is something I heard in my research. I want to share too that some of what the academic literature said about intrapersonal diversity is that, well, intrapersonal functional diversity, again, like that's only in a, a workplace setting, allows people to think more broadly naturally and be less susceptible to bias in their decision making. Let me say it again. Intrapersonal functional diversity, so having broad professional experiences, allows someone to think more broadly, makes sense, and be less susceptible to bias in their decision making. So this is in a professional setting. Um, and it just intuitively makes sense, but this has been written about in the literature. Does this resonate with you? I mean, does it make sense to you, Marquise, that, okay, in a professional setting, if you've had more experiences at, as a professional in different functions, that of course, you're going to see things from more perspective and be less, less biased, less, have, you know, not so much blinders, but like multiple lenses, actually, that you could see things through. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the most frustrating things for me personally is when people are not able to do like to look beyond their personal opinion. Um, they just let their opinion dictate how they live life, especially at work, um, because working is oftentimes just habitually based. So they just let their thinking like typical thinking patterns run their daily lives. And when it comes to meetings, like they're not open to new ideas or new input. Um, and I think, yes, the people who are able to look beyond their personal opinions are people who have been exposed to lots of different ideas. They realize that they're often not right because the truth is so complicated. Um, everything is connected. And so how can you be right if you don't know everything? You know, I think that people who do not embrace interpersonal diversity don't realize that often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You touched on something there I want to I want to address too. And I, I, I really haven't spoken much about this. Um, but one of the things I think that polymathy or intrapersonal diversity can do for somebody is add a certain element of aliveness to their experience of being human. Because if what you experience, like if you, if you let yourself be a, a cog in a machine, professionally, and especially if you don't really pursue hobbies or, or other types of adding diverse experiences to your life, it can just start to feel like a groundhog day to some extent, I think, you know, like you're just kind of in a, in this rut and you're going and, you know, and, and a day turns to a week, turns a month. And then before you know it, like you've just spent decades of your life focusing in this one area. Um, but uh, the alternative is, you know, you're a polymathic type and you are open to experiences and you're curious and you're brave. And there's a certain kind of qualitative aliveness 
that I think goes along with that approach. So anyway, this doesn't really have to do with, um, I don't know. I just want to mention that. It's not quite so relevant, but I just want to say <laughs> for me anyway, there's a certain wonderfulness to allowing yourself to, to explore and experience the fullness of your humanity rather than sort of getting stuck in a, a narrow rut, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so next I wanna mention, um, okay, Huckman and Stats, and they're two researchers in 2011, they hypothesized that a team's level of intrapersonal diversity within the members would positively affect the team's performance the whole team's performance, particularly when the situation demands that the group change. And their rationale was, I'm gonna read this, and I loved this. With more diverse individual experiences, team members might map current problems to past experiences more accurately or use different cognitive representations more effectively to define and solve problems in new ways, end quote. So they basically, they posit that when cognitive problem solving demands are high, so when the diff, it's a difficult situation, that diverse experiences may improve performance by enabling access to a wider base of knowledge and improved information processing. So that's from Huckman and Stats in 2011. And I know I'm getting like super nerdy and scholarly by calling on the literature more today. I haven't done much of that. I figured I'd throw that in here a bit for this session. But Marquise, does this explanation make sense to you that like, even if you're intrapersonally diverse as a, an individual on a team made up of other intrapersonally diverse members, that together you're gonna be better at problem solving because you've got more to pull from. You can, they use the word, you can map current problems to past experiences more accurately. You've got different cogn cognitive representations. Um, and when the, the demands are high and the situation is difficult, that this is even more important then. Does that, does that fit with your, like the way you think of these concepts? Yeah, and I'll give a example for like how my brain just conceptualized it, why that makes sense. Um, I am by no means a programmer, so take this with a grain of salt, but to, for my understanding, artificial intelligence is only as powerful as the quantity of data that you give it. So artificial intelligence is amazing. It can do wonderful things. It can literally predict outcomes, but only if it has a large enough um, base of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, it makes sense to me where if you have a group of humans who have a large base of knowledge, they'll be able to attack problems more effectively because they have that wider base of knowledge. Yeah, more tools in the toolkit. You can fix more things. Yep. Right. More data, more experiences, more solutions. Exactly. All right, I'm going to share um, a couple other things from the academic. I'm just on a roll here. I'm going to share more from from the academic literature on intrapersonal diversity because people think this isn't a thing, but it's a thing. It's a thing. I want you to know it's a thing and I didn't make it up. Okay, <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, just a quick, uh, I'm just going to share. Scholars Hitt and Tyler, 1991, found that executives who have broad functional backgrounds are better at evaluating options and making strategic decisions when compared to their counterparts who have narrower functional backgrounds. Another one, Canella, Park, and Lee, 2008, said that intrapersonal functional diversity enhances information sharing on top management teams, and it improves sense-making and leads to better integration of available information. So within member, so within a person, their breadth of experience directly increases the group level information sharing, which leads to enhanced decision making, end quote. And they also say that the effects of intrapersonal diversity become more positive as environmental uncertainty grows. So basically what they're saying is that if I have broader functional experiences professionally, actually the information sharing and the communication we can do is better because we can speak more of the same language, right? So does that, do you have any thoughts or comments on that, Marquise? I would just say that that also speaks to the importance or something that gets a lot of people caught up is jargon. 
And so if we can, like you said, communicate with each other, if we both understand the same jargon, then yep. it makes sense that there will be better integration, more decision making, you know, it, it just makes sense to me. It seems logical. Yeah, exactly. So, th- I mean, this is a real opportunity for organizations if they can if they can figure out how to get the right combination of interpersonally diverse team team ma- members, especially in environments where there's a lot of uncertainty, um, it could be really advantageous to make sure that they're making the most strategic decisions. Right. Um, okay, another another bit from the academic literature. Yap, Chai, and Lemaire, 2005, stated that intrapersonal functional at work diversity can foster innovation. Um, and so what th- their study told us is that individual thinking tends to improve when people have more functional intrapersonal diversity. Okay. Any comments on that? Nope. nope. Okay. Another one. I've got a few more. <laughs> okay. Um, Park, Lim, and Birnbaum Moore, 2009, found evidence that individuals who are intra personally diverse can be of great value to the teams on which they work. So teams consisting of multi-knowledge, multi-knowledge individuals. So when a person understands multiple functional areas, they are more likely to understand the skills, strengths, and capabilities of other team members. This is interesting. So it's not just that they can communicate the same language, is that I can understand what you're good at and what you can do. Um, So because of this, individual team members share information more easily with one another, and they produce better information sharing among the team, as well as more shared understanding of of the other members of the team. So this, their research confirmed that the more multi-knowledge individuals that you have on a cross-functional team, the more innovative the team is. And it's essentially due to more information sharing. And so... I'm curious, Marquise, if you have any thoughts or observations on that study. Well, I kind of wanted to get your opinion. Um, I'm, do you think that greater functional intrapersonal diversity makes people more empathetic? Why would, as an individual, if I'm, so let's say I've gone through the whole gamut of a corporation, so I've worked all the jobs, why would that make me more understanding of where you're at I guess yeah I think it 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 probably could it depends on the type because not all not all polymaths or polymathic types are necessarily emotionally intelligent like that's that's another range that people can be on and some polymaths are just highly intellectual and very learned and you know not very skilled interpersonally but a lot of them are a lot of them that's just another you know they they are skilled interpersonally and emotionally and they can be empathetic um I think, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I just think it's interesting that if I have a whole set of diverse experiences myself, that it means I can understand other people's skills and strengths better. Like if I'm stuck in my own little limited single box, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have difficulty understanding what people in different boxes are good at. Cause I, I, I've never been in that box, yeah. right? Yeah. But if I, if I've, if I've got a box fort and I, I've been in lots of different, you know, parts of my own box fort, maybe this analogy is not very good, but point is people with more intrapersonal diversity are not only better at kind of communicating and, and also finding common ground and like the social, you know, aspects, but the fact that I can understand what you're better at as another member on the team, and then we can leverage our shared skill and knowledge together to elevate our effort. I just think that's so important. And yeah. I don't I don't know if organizations are really thinking that way about how they compose their teams, you know, and how to leverage the full skill set and how polymathic individuals can help make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. A few more, a few more um, from the literature. Hopefully this is not too nerdy for you guys. <laughs> All right, Day and Dragoni, 2015, said that increased intra-personal diversity better creates leadership capacity. So teams who have intra-personally diverse leaders may fare better than teams who have leaders with less intra-personal diversity. 
And that's regardless of how easy or difficult those prior experiences were for that person and whether or not those prior experiences for that leader were work or non-work experiences, because both can enhance leadership capacity. Another one, Bunderson and Sutcliffe in 2002 um, said that intrapersonal functional diversity has, quote, significant and positive implications for team processes and performance. And therefore, organizations can benefit considerably by seeking and developing management teams composed of individuals who are functionally broad and not just narrowly specialized in a single functional area, end quote. And, and they also say that intrapersonal diversity is most powerful for project team performance in volatile and uncertain environments, more so than stable ones. So here again, there's this theme of if you have high intrapersonal diversity, you do better in kind of a chaos and uncertainty than a specialist would. And that's, that's like your jive, that's your environment. You want challenge and you've got more tools to deal with that challenge. So Marquise, any thoughts on how people in actual leadership positions can perform better because of having broad, broad prior experiences? I think that that directly connects to the one that we just talked about, um, about being able to better understand the strengths of other people. You know, that's one of the most important mm -hmm. things for leaders to be able to not only serve, but also like help their followers grow, especially, you know, in a functional or a workplace environment, like to help those people not only get their job done, but also grow. And so as a, per as a leader, I can better understand your strengths because of my variety of experiences. I think that, that would, that's why. Yeah. All right. A few more questions um, before we move to breakout rooms, guys. So Marquise, when we first met, you had founded this group called Da Vinci's Dream. And I loved that name, by the way, Da Vinci's Dream. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, can you tell me more what, why you came up with that moniker? And, and also just speaking of Da Vinci, like what if Leonardo, he's been dead for like 500 years, but <laughs> if you could bring him back and sort of, I don't know, pick his brain. What do you think that he would wish for humanity if he were alive today? What do you think Da Vinci's dream would be for us? Yes. Uh, big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I will attack this with two quotes first off. Um, my two favorite quotes from Leonardo da Vinci are one, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. And two, I've been impressed with the urgency of doing knowing is not enough we must apply being willing is not enough we must do and so for me that really speaks to one the importance of interpersonal diversity you know everything is connected um in order to really understand anything you really do need to understand everything even if at a base level, you know, you cannot, or for me, what it was most fascinating about my college experience, even though it nearly destroyed my passion for learning, is how similar physics is to chemistry, how similar chemistry and physics are to biology. You know, it's really easy to be a chemist and specialize in chemistry, but in my opinion, and like just from my personal experience, it was way easier to understand chemistry when I also had knowledge of biology and physics, especially physics. I hated physics, but it was easier <laughs> when I had an understanding of chemistry and biology. So one, the importance of acknowledging that the breadth of the human experience is just as important as the depth. Mm -hmm. So going back to Da Vinci's dream, the Da Vinci's dream is really an umbrella brand. Um, for me, after I realized the importance of polymathy, I made it my mission to make it easier for, indi for polymathic individuals to create fulfilling lives. Um, something that I really struggle with is the emphasis on specialists. Um, I really see, and it's, again, the reason I went to college 
was because I was told that in order to be successful, and one of my biggest driving things is to have a tangible impact on the lives of others. I want to really, before I die, have a tangible impact on the individual lives of people. And I was told that the best way to do that was to become a specialist. Go study something and study it for the rest of your life. That is not true. <laughs> but unfortunately, polymathic individuals and people who choose to study a lot of things, it is not as easy for them to create fulfilling, happy, successful lives as it is, as it is for specialists, in my opinion. And so the purpose of Da Vinci's dream is to really create a level playing field. Like you said, specialists are very important in order for society to progress. However, generalists are just as important. And until society acknowledges that, and it is systemically just as easy for generalists to create fulfilling and successful lives, society is going to stagnate, in my opinion. And so that is really the purpose of Da Vinci's dream. Um, the way I'm doing that, the way Da Vinci's Dream is doing that is by attacking, so you could think of Google. Google is a brand that everybody knows and loves. However, Google is not like the parent company. Google has a parent company whose purpose is to do who knows what, but they took that purpose and then they created Google and everybody knows it. So Da Vinci's Dream is really the alphabet or the parent company of these other um, facets that will tangibly enable polymathic individuals to create fulfilling lives. Awesome. Well, I love that you want to have impact. Me too. I think we all want that. We all want our lives to matter and to make a difference, right? Yeah. One thing I want to say too, I, I recently came across this, um, this phrase and I just want to share it with you guys. We've all heard of lifelong learning, right? And I, I spout that and I talk about, I say a polymaths are lifelong learner, self-directed learner. And I read this the other day about life-wide learning. And I thought, oh, that's so good. That's kind of what, what, it's not just like the time that you spend learning, it's the breadth of learning, the life-wide learning that you can do. So I really like that term, life-wide learning. Okay, last question for you, Marquise. As a polymathic individual yourself, and clearly someone who's thought about this, read about this, dedicated yourself to supporting other polymathic individuals, what advice do you have for someone who would like to explore or express or expand their own intrapersonal diversity more in the future? What advice would you have? Be intentional. This is something that I'm working on right now, but ultimately society will not encourage you to explore the breadth of the human experience. And just as it is really easy for specialists to get in a rut and like just like you said experience that groundhog day like that is something that all humans do um growth is not easy for us unless we do it intentionally and so if you really do want to live a polymathic life you have to do it intentionally i love that yeah you know i've said it before that you know polymathy for me is kind of a way to design your life to make your life your art and to paint with different colors instead of having like a monochromatic painting you can have a rainbow painting a really interesting painting and uh really i mean we're each and this relates to what we were talking about earlier too we're each born into the world and we had no say when what color what sex what sexual orientation in my opinion like we're just there you get you get this and this inheritance genetically and one of the things I love is that polymathy is kind of a way to give birth to myself, myself. Mm -hmm. It's a way to self-author my own story through broad exposure and through curating. And I, I use that word on purpose, curating, like a museum curator would, would curate a collection. Um, that, that we can each be the curators of our own lives. And of course, there's going to be difficulties and limitations. It's not like we have magical powers to curate anything we'd like, but I, I just want to, you know, encourage people who, who want to explore the fullness of their humanity to think about like, well, this is a way of giving birth, giving life to yourself by exploring all the parts of your personhood. Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> All right. So we've been at this for about an hour. Um, Shrikant, I think we are ready for the breakout rooms uh, and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Angela. And thanks, uh, Marquis. So folks, it's time for breakout rooms. 
As always, these are the guidelines for the breakout rooms. We want as many people engaged as possible. So start the breakout rooms by letting everyone speak for one to two minutes before beginning a discussion. So we get as many voices down. Remember that you've been keeping notes on all your great thoughts. So talk only about the greatest ones of those. Rules, keep on topic, be brief, be courteous, encourage others to speak. If needed, just click on ask for help and I'll help you. We'll run this for 20 minutes, at the end of which we'll be back here to share our takeaways and ask any questions that you may have. Okay, folks, so give me a second here, starting the breakout rooms now. Folks, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, we are now going to do our takeaways. Um, as always, we've got four rules. Uh, rule number one, raise your hand in Zoom or preferably put an exclamation mark in the chat to speak, okay? You can either give your takeaways, give, put a question on the table or both. Rule number two, keep on topic. Rule number three, be brief. And rule number four, speak your mind, feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. All right, so let's start with Barry, Joe and Jade. Barry, welcome Barry, go ahead. Yes, uh, and I have my journal here just uh, and I wrote uh, and Excellent. I wrote down what I and so this is what I I came up with listen to everybody talk and I kind of I like to simplify I, I think polymaths are good at simplifying complex things whereas monomaths are good at making simple things complicated okay and I say I believe that just as a diverse species in uh, makes uh, the ecosystem more resilient um, in a changing environment that the intrapersonal diversity makes the person more resilient in an environmentally changing situation. And, uh, and I think this is the problem. It, we live in a, a environment that is constantly changing because of technology. It is changing exponentially. Whereas we as a culture do not keep pace with the change in technology. And so we be, we're a tribal culture, which was necessary when you lived in a non-changing environment. But now we live in this highly changing environment. We need to be more diverse or we're going to collapse. That is really the concern. So we as polymaths are here to save the world. We're heroes. I love that. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Barry. That was fantastic as always. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Joe, Jade, and Paul. Joe. I'm, I'm not going to be able to save the world. Uh, so I, I don't know if uh, that's Joe, pretty, that's Joe, pretty hard thing to follow. Joe, you have to write a, you know, you have to write a poem. See, that's what. Uh, <laughs> Go, Joe. Go ahead. Uh, no. So um, I, I looked at it. Uh, it was actually interesting because I think that right as we were breaking out that uh, I was going to get some disagreement from a couple of uh, people in my group, and I like that. Um, and uh, but uh, the one aspect of it that I thought was really important is the idea of how you spoke about self awareness and understanding your skill sets, you know, where they fit into an organization or things like that. Um, and I thought that that was it's really important to see what value you bring outside of your current position and your job. But that's a very difficult thing to do if it's a very, um, it's a very a hierarchical kind of organizational structure so that you're not necessarily seeing the whole picture, that you're not really able to see um, where your skill sets are best suited 
and and get some of that uh you know that, that incorporate we're incorporating as many frames of reference as possible um so that that was one takeaway that we had um that i had um so the other was the uh the comment about it allowing you to be less biased um and i found that to be interesting as well because i do think that if you start to you know develop as many experiences as possible and this is where we may have disagreed a little bit is that you can develop a certain level of empathy um for other people and it actually will you know you the not only develop empathy but you also uh develop an understanding of what other people are going through so therefore you're bias against them to say that job is easy or this is easy kind of goes away a little bit now a couple of people in our room had made the comment that if something is easy to everyone then and they're a polymath then they may not they may not have that uh experience where they actually are probably dismissive and probably still biased against certain people uh in their jobs so that was where i kind of got the uh, the um pushback a little bit. And I think ultimately, lastly, I, I think an important part about this is adaptability and understanding um, not only it's how to work with other people. And I, I think there's a leadership component out of that more than it is actually polymathy uh, with these when you're talking about uh, interpersonal type of uh, skills um, uh, that you're developing because you're you're uh, that you're or interpersonal diversity because you also have to be able to incorporate as many diverse perspectives as possible. So communication is fundamentally key and how you communicate with people and get them to work as a whole is really something that um, is the goal. Uh, so I, I think that that a communication aspect and a leadership aspect of this is really important as well. Yeah, thanks, now, you'll, and I'll yield the balance of Mike's time. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you just lost some of your time. Uh, it was yielded back. Uh, okay, uh, next up is Jade. Jade, go ahead. Uh, Angela, would you, uh, Angela or uh, Marquise, did you want to respond? If you want to respond to anything, just unmute yourself and respond, okay? Okay, you know, the only thing I'll say, I, you know, both Barry and Joe made a lot of really good observations with re particular regard to empathy. Like I have not studied our, our people who are more polymathic, more empathetic. As far as I know, that study has not been done. I think it makes sense naturally that if you've had more exposure to different types of people, different cultures, different professional experiences, different hobbies, that it naturally sort of puts you in this mind frame of like, understanding multiple perspectives and at the end of the day that's what being empathetic is it's understanding i'm i'm not in your shoes but i can imagine that and i can i can sort of feel for you for for the difficulty you're going through so but i will say there are you know there's a range of polymathic skill and some polymaths may be super intellectual and not very emotional and then they're not good at empathy and, and then there may be other polymaths who are just really skilled interpersonally. They've got this broad toolkit. They can connect with anybody. They can understand another's perspective and another's experience. And they're really good at empathy. So I think, you know, like polymathy itself, the ability to be empathetic exists on a range and a spectrum and some people are better at it than others. Thank you, Angela. Uh, next up is going to be Jade. Uh, so it's gonna be Jade, Paul, Kevin, Jyoti and Jeff. Jade, go ahead. Um, so I had a few things. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about since um, it was just brought up is kind of the fact that having diverse interests doesn't like, let's push the skills aside. And it, having diverse interests doesn't mean you're interested in everything. And unfortunately, it means you might not be interested in people. Like people just might not be um, one of your interests or having diverse um, friends might not be your interest or um, connections might not be your interest because I think we've kind of established that, um, I just lost my train of thought, but it's kind of like if 
if you don't, I have to come back to that one because I lost my train of thought on that one. But I would also say that um, we are kind of already have people who, my mind is all over the place. Sorry, I'm a little scattered, but I'm feeling like the concept of people only connecting on similarities is kind of why we have problems. Um, because a lot of people are more different than they are similar. Um, even though we have a lot of basic needs and things like that are similar. Um, but I think the ability to connect on differences is something that should be considered because especially if we're going to put forth the concept of lifelong learners, it kind of, to me, implies that, um, you would want to learn about someone because people who are very different from you give you an opportunity to learn. Because I don't know who you are, how you function, or why you function the way you function. So it gives me an opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be where we connect. You learn about me, I learn about you. Um, yeah. Again, that learning has to be something interesting. Um, then um, I was also wondering, uh, like even to go a little more on the point of, um, I'll call it intellectual diversity. It, it, it's kind of very true. Like I could go to a bar in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and I could see people of all different kinds of faces and looks, but they all have the same mindset. Um, so it, it, it's misleading. It's a question, I think, again, what type of diversity do people value? Because even within there, people are still from different cultural backgrounds, even when they've come and they've set on a, on a, on a same cultural platform. But I think that's also leading to me saying that because there are places where I will go and people will, might believe that I'm one dimensional. And the reason why they're thinking it is because we're interacting and they're only getting a perspective of me that shows that one dimension. So there, it, I think sometimes we end up making the mistake of making that snap judgment and not recognizing that there's usually more to most everything, including people than it seems. Mm -hmm. Jade, you made a I great think point. I'll it uh, let me, let me uh, add one thing, uh, Angela. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so Jade is doing a meetup tomorrow on this general topic of self and society, of the diversity of roles that we play. So for example, let me just show you. Uh, so it's going to be, uh, so firstly, I'm putting this link in the meetup. It's going to be about self and society. An island is only an island because of its relationships. So what we are going to do is that we're going to see the diversity of roles that people play. This is based on Jungian concept of archetypes. And many times we play kind of combinations of these roles and we have difficulty when somebody else is playing different roles. We get along with some people and not get along with some people uh, based on that. So it's a very, it's a very deep way of looking at you know, diversity uh, of roles that we can play, the functions that we can play within our own lives and within society. And we're going to be discussing kind of the social dynamics of different people playing the role. So it's going to be really, really interesting. So that's going to be tomorrow uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern time. This was at the last moment. So uh, be, be sure to check it out. Uh, you know, we we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Angela. Go ahead. Wait. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Sorry. I just... can... Oh, sorry. Can I say one more thing? I'm sorry. Yes. No, no, go or for I it. I can wait for after Anthony's no, no. done. Go for it. Go for it. Um, so one other thing that I forgot to say is that I'm wondering because we're out of the diversity thing again, is again, with the differences is, can we accept people that don't fit in? And if so, how? And also should we? And should we accept people who don't fit in everywhere? And if so, why? Um, Cause like, for instance, there was, I won't go into the story, but I, I, there's, there's a question of, you know, is everyone for everybody and is everyone for everything? I don't think I'm for everything. If I'm for everybody, that, that'd be up for debate. But I, I, some things I just don't have interest in. Um, 
can I develop it? Perhaps, um, but I don't think I'm going to become a physicist anytime. So it's like that question of how diverse do we really need to be? But I have a basic understanding of like the properties. So I could kind of have a dialogue with someone who is a physicist, but I can't go deep. Again, that would be me learning and I would be asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a few, a, a few thoughts. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you for all your observations. Um, I think you make a great point, and I really was negligent in focusing too much on connecting over commonality. I, I mean, I think the general tendency with most people is like if you can find something in common with someone that's comfortable and uh, easy. But absolutely, we should be able to connect mm -hmm. on, over difference as well. And in fact, this is uh, you know just one example, but. One of the people I interviewed said that he loved being around people that were different from him. He called, he actually said he, the polymath was the parasite of the, the expert. Actually, he loved being around people who were not polymathic, for example, because of what he could learn from them. So absolutely. We should be able to connect over differences and leverage that and appreciate that too. Um, should we accept people who don't fit in? Absolutely. Polymaths normally feel like they don't entirely fit in anywhere. <laughs> Um, and it's very much a singular journey for the most part. Part of why I created the, a Facebook group called Polymass Place is because I wanted Polymass to feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm unique in my combination, but, you know, at least I can sort of identify as polymathic and find others who are like me in that. Like back to the, you're unique, just like everybody else thing. Um, you know, you may not find a, a person that is exactly like you or has your experiences, your combinations, but if we all sort of embrace the hodgepodge myriad things we are, we can we can share that experience. And then how diverse do we need to be? I mean, this is such a singular journey, you know, like your life is your art and your expression and your um, adventure. And so what you learn about, what you explore, uh, what you expose yourself to or not, like that's what makes your life unique and fun. So, so if you don't want to learn about physics, then don't, you know, and if you can't connect over that, then whatever, who cares, you know, like you get to connect over dance or whatever it is that you like. So anyway, I don't know, uh, Marquise, if you have any, anything to add. Yeah, I actually just wanted to underscore. I thought this was so powerful and personally, because I find that the keys to innovation and the keys to progress, they often lie in the, if we think of a Venn diagram, like the circle of those differences, you know, like the intermediary, that is the key to learning, the key to progress. When I have a conversation with Angela or Jade or um, Srikant, you know, and those where we do not agree, where there are those differences, that is where we can both grow. So I thought that was so powerful. Thank you for sharing, Jade. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Marquis. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin, Jyoti, and Jeff. Kevin. Hey, sir. Um, I, I would say you follow the conversation, you know, we, we, we don't need to use a binary array to uh, explain everything. You know, let's see if we are polymaths with respect to that's mean we learn a language individual or let's see even who is uh, specialized or specific. We try to learn that language so I get in. You don't need 100 to fit in, but everybody self is individual, right? So we got our own community. Um, by the way, I actually, Marquis, you mentioned that uh, bio, biology, you might, chemistry, it's giving you got a similar feeling, but even further is a, a got question. There's a lot of common terminology and can understand each other, but the teacher didn't tell us that. Later on, we find out we can, if I could know that earlier, I can even understand it deeper and, and better. So the one way I find it possible, we can use abstraction. This word may, and method kind of mapping those uh, terminology, even the hierarchy. Even this morning before this uh, um, uh, meetup, we got another, another one. We find a solution actually, this one. We use polymath can kind of solve. We have either use eligible people or Christian or let's, we, we use one word, sp spiritual, 
right? Then mapping time, we got a religion or not a religion, religion which one, but we find something in common. We try to pursue the goal for our life. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, next up is going to be Jyoti followed by Jeff. Jyoti. Yeah, hi, Angela and Marquis. I have to be honest with you. Today was my first day for this kind of a presentation, polymath, because it usually it's on the weekends and today it is snowing. So I had nowhere to go, no, nothing to do. So I thought I will attend this. Uh, with the same token, I have to say it is it was very interesting. And I think um, the way you described, I would think that I'm a polymath. However, I have a dual personality in, in the sense I connect very well with people who are thinking like ways. But then when I'm in the Zoom or I have friends all over in the world who don't think the way I do think, and I, no, I'm not compatible with them, but I'm not alienated by them either because I'm very understanding and I understand they haven't had those varied experiences that I have had in my life and my circumstances too. Uh, and I don't think I'm a cocky person because I had all those things in my bag. I can relate to them. So having said that, if I was, I was given a choice in terms of connecting with people, I would go with my intellectual compatibility. However, in terms of diversity in the race and ethnic group and what have you, I don't think I have a problem, but believe it or not, they have a problem because they do look at me as other, which I'm, they do look at it that way. There's nothing I can do. So both the you know uh, concepts have their own merits. Mm -hmm. So having said that, I think Joseph, I uh, Joe, <laughs> when we departed, I was going to disagree with you on that one. And that piece was, he was saying, the more you know, the more you have learned, the more experiences you have, you become um, your biases go away. I don't agree with that. I think. I have come across people who are very smart and they, I mean, they are very easy to connect with in many ways. However, when they form a decision, when you make a decision, there's an underlying bias. Why aren't you thinking like I'm thinking? I can't agree with you. So that's what I was gonna to say to Joe. And um, the other thing is this, that is so important to play different roles in your life. You know, you can't, you should not just become one way only because that is not how the world is. That's not how the world operates. But I would like to know where is a polymathic group that I can connect with and see what comes out of it from, for me a little bit too. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. If you have any comment to make, please feel free to. Yeah, thank you, Jody. Well, I, uh, Jody, I do wanna say, um, we do have a Facebook group called Polymath Place. And okay. you're welcome to join uh, if you're on Facebook. Um, and I think your point about playing different roles in your life, I think that's beautiful. And the fact that you can fit in with like-minded people or, you know, you can also not feel alienated when you're around people with different perspectives. I think that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next you. up is going to be Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. So um, Angela and, and all you, I, you know, I, I'm a frequent guest, a visitor here. I, I, I love your perspective on this. And um, I wanna offer just two, two things. One, that um, I, I actually um, engage with leadership teams of all kinds of companies and organizations and agencies. And as you might imagine, you know, the, the, the levels of expertise between a chief financial officer, a chief technology officer, an HR director, um, a marketing, you know, a market analysis person, a sales, a person who's oriented to sales, their personal orientations and their levels of expertise and experience are very, very diverse. So what works when you, when you achieve this, in essence, sort of, you know, polymathy within, by creating an incredibly diverse team? 
So first of all, um, what, what's necessary to work is that folks can stay curious about stuff they don't know and can actually depend on each other in that way. Um, and so uh, that kind of situational leadership that they uh, contribute in, in the team is essential. So any, so it, it, it's not that it's not that people who are in, who don't have expertise can't relate or work well together. It's people who have expertise but are not curious about the stuff they don't know and not able to depend on others who do know it. In my experience, that's where it breaks down, creates all kinds of conflict, all kinds of inefficiencies, um, to people talking over each other, destructive disagreement, all kinds of potholes there. Second is that beyond the level of um, intellectual or academic or whatever kind of expertise people bring, emotional intelligence is a real thing. And people's level of individual self-awareness and compassion and uh, curiosity about really learning the perspectives and, and the perceptions uh, of others who, have, who come from different vantage points from them by, by lived experience or by or where, whatever those diversities might be is huge. And um, so, so first of all, just people's ability to appreciate the, um, the different kinds of expertise that others bring, maintain a certain amount of polymathy themselves. Um, uh, and, and then second, their ability to pull off a level of self-awareness and compassion and interest in the perspectives and perceptions of others who are different from them. I think those are some of the, those are some things I would add to, to it, it, polymathy is one great, wonderful thing. These other things are pretty important too. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Thank I don't you. even want to taint it with any other comments because what you said was exactly right, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, all right, folks. So let's see, uh, th that is it. So what we're going to do is uh, first, let me ask Angela, what's, Angela, what's coming up two weeks from now? Two weeks from now, we have a meetup on polymathy, um, the leading thinkers in polymathy studies. So Michael Araki, who's another scholar in this field, will be my special guest. And we're going to be talking about what do we know about polymathy? What's been studied? Like, you know, just from the from an academic perspective. So that's what we're going to be talking about February 21st at 2.30 Eastern time. Wonderful. And Michael Araki was here before and he gave a fantastic presentation on polymathy. So please go to our, um, you know, YouTube video for uh, and go to the comprehensivist playlist and you will find Michael Araki's video there. It was one of the best overview of the question about, you know, polymathy. Uh, he had this beautiful diagram summarizing all kinds of things. So, uh, you know, I recommend watching that before the meetup if you can, because you will get more from it. All right, folks. So uh, I wanted to let you know that at five o'clock we have a special event. Um, Dante, my friend Dante, is seven hundred now. So uh, we are celebrating Dante. A whole bunch of us are reading it, uh, reading, um, and even if you're not read, you're welcome because we're going to give kind of overviews. Um, today, we are getting started in a slow way by looking at his early work called The New Life. And we're going to get into the divine comedy from next month onwards. A whole bunch of us are reading it together and we'll be sharing our impressions of Dante. There, are, there is a actor who is going to read out uh, Dante so you get a flavor of it. There is a person who has his historian is going to give you a historical perspective on Dante. So don't miss it. Um, all right. And that's going to be at this one. And uh, any final thoughts for or Marky, uh, Marky and uh, Angela? Go ahead. Marquise, yes. do you have any final thoughts or comments before we wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually wanted to bring up two things. One would be um, Donna mentioned earlier that everyone is a polymath in our breakout. 
in our breakout room. And I think that is so important to take away is that oftentimes we really do think of um, poly polymathy as binary. Somebody else mentioned that as well. And that is so dangerous. Um, we are all polymaths. I truly do agree with that. And just the scale, the, 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 the depth of your polymathy is what changes. And two, I want to touch on something that Giotti mentioned. Giotti, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. But you said um, something along the lines of, you found that even individuals with many, or even polymathic individuals, even highly intellectual individuals still view you based on your like external qualities, not necessarily your intellectual diversity. And I think that that was an important um, observation because it, it highlights the fact that even people who are highly intellectual are still susceptible to unconscious biases. And I think that those biases I mean, that's one of the things that dictates our habits. And so just tying this back to intrapersonal diversity, intrapersonal diversity. The only thing that really overcomes unconscious biases is experiences, personal experiences. If I it was taught to be, well, this is gonna be really extreme, but I'm gonna say it anyways. If I was taught to be a racist, the only person, the only way that I will overcome those unconscious biases is by personal experience. No matter how much information, no matter how many facts, no matter how many people tell me my ideas are wrong, only personal experience will overcome that. And so I think that that really does just highlight even again, the importance of interpersonal diversity. And that's all I wanted to say. Can Thank I you. can I make a comment, uh, Shrikant? Oh, very quickly. Uh, just... okay. Yeah, because I do have, he knows I'd ramble on. I think you misunderstood about the intellectual compatibility. Oh. Yeah, okay, but we'll leave it at that. That's okay, okay. no problem. Okay. Was, I short Was I short enough? Yes, and I'm glad that your dog let you attend this meetup. It's only because it is snowing outside. Okay. He's, sleep he's so sleeping right by my side. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Jyoti. Thank you. Um, and Marky, I really liked your comments about uh, Leonardo da Vinci. I'm a big fan. Um, I traveled from when I was living in Seattle, I traveled all the way to UCLA mm. to look up his notebooks. <laughs> his biggest collection of notebooks is called Codex Atlanticus. So I went to the rare books collection in UCLA and I said, you know, I would like to see it. So he says, the, the librarian says to me, really? So I said, yes, I've come all the way for Seattle. He says, okay. And he goes away, he's gone for like 45 minutes. And then he comes back with a trolley, Codex Atlanticus, <laughs> they are about like three foot wide and two feet this way. And it's 12 volumes oh. of, uh, you know, his original man manuscripts uh, reproductions. There are 12 copies here. So I'm a very big fan uh, of Leonardo and there is a lot to be learned mm. from him. Uh, and folks, I recommend Leonardo's notebooks to everybody. That's a great way of getting to know a great mind and all the struggles and all the, um, all the positives uh, of, of being, being such a person. So wonderful. Uh, Angela, any final thoughts? Yeah, I just wanna say thank you to Marquise. It was great to see you and chat with you. Despite being like this young person, you are just so capable and so influential. And I just see so many things positive happening in your future. And I'm glad that you're on this sort of team of promoting polymathy. Um, and I love, like I've told you before, I love that your organization is called Da Vinci's Dream because I think what would Da Vinci's Dream be? It, it would be that, that we all could be more polymathic like he was. Um, and as a final thought, I just wanna say, you know, I know this term intrapersonal diversity and to some extent, even the term polymathy is very new to a lot of people because we don't really talk about it. Um, and I just, I hope it was, it was thought provoking and interesting for you to think about these, uh, you know, these aspects of our personhood and in particular thinking about diversity in kind of a new way. So I hope you found it interesting. And that, that's pretty much my final thought. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Angela. And th thank you, Marky. And thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to close off the meetup for a few minutes and we will be back on at 445 for Dante. See you folks.